Yes, the time has come when I can finally reveal just how fast the heavily anticipated GeForce GTX 1080 actually is. I know exactly what you guys want, benchmarks, and lots of them. So rather than taking you on another boring tour around the Founders Edition card, which you've no doubt been drooling over for the last week or so on YouTube already, let's get right into it. For those wanting to know more about the core and memory configuration, please check out this video from a few days ago. It pretty much covers everything you need to know about the hardware. I've got a variety of other 1080 themed videos coming up, including an overclocking guide and more, so there'll be plenty of coverage and information, don't you worry. Now we know the GTX 1080 costs 700 US for the Founders Edition card and $600 for the upcoming partner cards. For my Aussie viewers, the Founders card will cost around $1000, with board partner cards hopefully coming in under $900. With the pricing locked in, the only other real consideration for gamers is performance, so let's find out how the GTX 1080 gets on. Kicking off the proceedings, we have an absolute classic, Battlefield 4. Here we see the 1080 getting a mighty 99 FPS. This made for just 16% more than the Titan X, which may surprise a few people, although I'm expecting this to be one of the titles where these two cards are closest. The 1080 was 29% faster than the 980 Ti, 68% faster than the 980, and 50% faster than the Fury X. Not too bad at all. Despite what many have been hoping, it wasn't able to top a pair of 980 Ti's and SLI. At 4K, the margins between the cards were very similar, where the 1080 was good for a 50 FPS average. All the percentage differences were very close to the 1440p results, and this is the theme you can expect to see play out through the rest of our benchmarks. Gamers have been longing for a GPU that could handle the very demanding Witcher 3, and at 1440p it proved to be no problem for the GTX 1080, which rendered an average of 74 frames per second and a minimum of just under 60 FPS. 4K Witcher action has been pretty much an impossibility at maximum quality, and unfortunately the 1080 doesn't really change that. Having said that, it did come very close to the performance of the 980Ti's and SLI, and was 22% faster than the Titan X. At 1440p, the GTX 1080 was a bit of a monster in Black Ops 3, and was good for 111 FPS. This was 23% faster than the Fury X, which does a great job in this game, and a healthy 42% faster than the 980Ti. At 4K, the 1080 was just shy of the glorious 60 FPS average we're all chasing. This made it 70% faster than the 980, and 23% faster than the Titan X. In Far Cry Primal, the 1080 managed a healthy 72 FPS average, and was the only single card config to get over 60 FPS. At 4K, things were a little choppy, and gamers who want to play at this resolution might need a 1080 SLI setup in order to get over 60 FPS at ultra quality. It was a whopping 74% faster than the similarly priced 980, and 29% faster than AMD's Fury X. In Star Wars Battlefront at 1440p, the new 1080 was between 18 and 24% faster than its main three rivals. Relative to the GTX 980, it was a considerable 56% faster, and this is one of the lower margins when compared to that card. At 4K, the margins were similar. The 1080 was 17% faster than the Titan X here, and 23% faster than both the Fury X and the 980 Ti, which both managed an average of 39 frames, though the Ti had a much higher minimum. At the Vault Exit, Fallout 4 was good for over 100 frames per second, a healthy 25% faster than the Titan X. The minimum was also impressive, with frame rates staying over 90. At 4K, we were quite close to the elusive 60fps mark, with a 55fps average and a 45fps minimum. The 1080 was 25% faster than the Titan X, and 34% faster than the Fury X. First we'll take a look at Tomb Raider and DirectX 11. Here the 1080 was good for a solid 102 FPS, which was 57% faster than the Fury X, and 21% faster than the Titan X. At 4K, the other cards managed to close the gap a little. The 1080 was good for 53 frames on average, and a minimum of 34 FPS, which made for a slightly choppy experience, though it was the only card with a minimum above 30. In the case of Tomb Raider, switching to DirectX 12 actually slows down performance, so I can't imagine there are many, or any gamers that actually do. Anyway, the 1080 was good for 100 FPS here, 25 frames more than the 980Ti SLI configuration, and 72% faster than the Fury X. At 4K, the 1080 was still well out in front, with an average of 51 FPS, and a minimum of at least 10 frames higher than any other card or cards. Our star of the show monstered F1 2015, pumping out 140 frames per second at 1440p. This was 25% more than the Titan X, 31% more than the 980Ti, and 47% more than the Fury X. 
At 4K, the gap was closed a little bit, although the 1080 was the only card able to stay above 60 FPS throughout the entire test. The 1080 was good for 119 FPS on average in GTA 5, which was 24% more than the Titan X. I guess my prediction of 20 to 25% more performance seems to be coming true. Relative to the Fury X, it was good for 34% more performance also. At 4K, the 1080 was just shy of being able to produce a 60 FPS average with everything cranked up and with a little tweaking, 4K gamers will be very happy. The Titan X was a little closer at this higher resolution, coming within 16% of the 1080, while the Fury X was within 31%. In our ashes of the singularity graphs, we're looking at the DirectX 11 and DirectX 12 performance together. At 1440p in DirectX 12, the Fury managed to come within 7% of the GTX 1080, while the other cards maintained similar margins seen in other games. At 4K, this gap was closed further, to the point where there was no gap at all. The 1080 managed the same 46 FPS as the Fury X, but again maintained its margins over its Nvidia brethren. The 1080 was comfortably over the 60 FPS mark in Just Cause 3 at 1440p with all the settings cranked up and a healthy 27% faster than the Titan X. At 4K, it couldn't quite close in on 60 FPS, though again it was 27% faster than the Titan X, and it's probably the only configuration that could be considered playable in this game at 4K, especially since SLI and Crossfire don't really work. The 1080 handled Rainbow Six Siege like no one's business, producing an impressive 131 frames. This is another title where SLI really struggles, and it's not really properly supported. 4K Siege saw Terra slayed at 65 FPS with a 52 FPS minimum, while the other comparable cards followed the same pattern and rough percentages that we've seen throughout our benchmark results for the average frame rates. Something interesting worth noting here are the minimum frame rates of the AMD Fiji GPUs. The Fury X, Fury and Nano cards all dip down to very low frame rates, though it has to be said I only saw them occurring for brief moments. I think this difference can mostly be attributed to the smaller 4GB of HBM memory, as the game was tested using the Ultra HD Texture Pack on Steam. In Tom Clancy's other tested title, the 1080 was just shy of keeping frames above 60 FPS at all times at 1440p. At 4K, things were tight with the Fury X, Titan X and 980 Ti, all of which fell within the 14% margin, although none of these cards could really produce what could be considered very playable performance, with the 1080's 33 FPS minimum the highest of the bunch, including the 980 Ti as an SLI. An oldie bit of goodie, Crisis 3 is still demanding and pushed the 1080 to its non-overclocked limits to stay above a 60 FPS minimum. Here the 1080 crushed its opposition with nearly 60% more performance than the Fury X and 46% more than the 980 Ti. 4K reeled the 1080 in a bit to 34 FPS, although it was still a long way ahead of its rivals in terms of percentage with the best fight put up by the Titan X with its mere 24 FPS. Obviously all of these cards rendered the game pretty unplayable and 4K games will still have to tweak some settings. Apparently Arkham Knight works these days and 1080 owners will be able to play it best. At 1440p, the card was good for 108 frames per second, leaving all of its competition in its wake. At 4K, the 1080 was close to a healthy 60 FPS average, although its minimum dropped down to match that of the Titan X, only just edging out the 980 Ti, while a little further ahead of the Fury X. All of these cards were a lot closer together in this title. While it looks pretty good, Mad Max is not a demanding title, and at 1440p, it sees all of our top contenders with 99 frames or more, with the 1080 leading the pack by a healthy margin. At 4K, it was only the 1080 that managed over 60 FPS on average, and it was really the only card that could offer smooth, playable performance at 4K without splurging for two cards. Anno 2205 saw the 1080 overpower the Titan X by a considerable 30% at 1440p and the Fury X by 62%. At 4K, the 1080's minimum rivaled the averages of the other cards at 35 frames and was good for nearly 50 FPS on average. This was another title where SLI was not only useless but a slight hindrance. Dirt Rally showed slightly closer margins than some of our other games tested, with the Titan X coming within 17% and the Fury X within 25% of the 1080 performance. At 4K, the 1080 is able to keep this game above 60 FPS, producing a 62 frame minimum and 70 FPS average. While it still led the pack aside from the SLI config, the margins were again a little closer than our average. Middle Earth's 1440p results are in line with the others that we've seen so far, with the GTX 1080 making 103 frames per second, good for 20 to 25% more than the Titan X, 980 Ti and the Fury X. At 4K, the results were very similar to Dirt Rally. The 1080 was 19% faster than the Fury X and 21% faster than the Titan X, while the 980 was left behind on 37 frames per second. Our newest game of the bunch, Doom, saw some interesting results using its OpenGL game engine. At 1440p, the margins were fairly standard, though a little closer than our average. At 4K, the Titan X pulled within 8%, 
the 980 Ti within 10% and the Fury X within 15%. These are the closest margins we've seen for the other Nvidia cards and one of the closer ones too for the Fury X. Finally, we've got everyone's favourite, Armour 3. Here the 1080 made for some healthy figures at 1440p, pulling 75 frames per second on average with a minimum of 67. At 4K, the 1080 maintains its margins, though it's reduced to an average of 42 FPS, making the game pretty unplayable to be honest. 4K gamers will have to do what they're very used to doing, lower the quality settings if they want smooth performance. Nvidia have been touting the 1080 as being a huge step forward in terms of efficiency, boasting twice the performance watt for watt. But exactly how many watts does it use? I averaged out the power consumption for all of these cards in The Witcher 3, Crisis 3, Battlefront, GTA 5 and Far Cry Primal, and the results speak for themselves. The 1080 consumed just 266 watts on average, which was 20% less than the Titan X to provide an average 21% better performance. This is undoubtedly a huge step forward and gamers and their parents who pay the power bills worldwide will be pleased to hear it. The 1080 Founders Edition operating temperatures were very reasonable considering the frequencies at which it was running. In Doom for instance, the 1080 was running at 1835 MHz but managed to stay 3 degrees cooler than its 980 Ti counterpart which was running at 82 degrees. In every game tested, the 1080 ran at around 80 degrees, which is impressive given the card was barely audible and of course the resulting frame rate performance. Well, there's really no other way to put it. That was a crap load of data. So let's get into it. A GeForce GTX 1080 rendered on average 52 frames per second at 4K and this meant it was 21% faster than the Titan X, 28% faster than the 980 Ti and wait for it, 63% faster than the vanilla GTX 980. The 1080 also had no trouble dispatching the Fury X where it was 30% faster at 4K. Interestingly, while the margins were much the same at 1440p between the Nvidia cards, the 1080 was even faster when compared to the Fury X here, delivering 36% more performance on average. Making a quick cost per frame analysis across the 21 games tested, we see that even at $700, the Founders Edition is exceptional value when compared to the current AMD and Nvidia high-end products. The board partner cards, which should start at $600, are going to do some real damage at a cost of just $11.55 in our test, making it 25% better value than the Fury X. To put up a fight in terms of cost per frame, AMD would have to discount the Fury X to $470, so it'll be interesting to see if they make that sort of move. I think if they don't, the Fury X might simply get left behind. As you can see here, although quite a bit slower than the new 1080, the Fury X is still a very capable graphics card, so if AMD is able to remain competitive in terms of pricing, then that'll be great news for gamers. The same is true for the GTX 980 Ti. Granted, it's now exited production and is therefore a little less relevant, you may however be able to grab a bargain as supplies run out. For current 980 Ti owners, I really don't recommend buying a second card for SLI. The performance is simply too inconsistent. If you'll be mostly playing a game that supports SLI well, then this isn't much of an issue, but if you like to dabble in various titles, then I suggest giving SLI a miss. If you're a GTX 980 owner, then you've no doubt been eyeing off the 1080 as a potential upgrade. At a similar cost upon release, at least for the board partner models anyway, the 1080 is the perfect upgrade for 980 owners. Those coming from a 980 can enjoy a massive 60% leap in performance at both 1440p and 4K, and as you can see on this line graph, that nets you a serious amount of extra frames. Like the Maxwell-based GPUs, the GTX 1080 has plenty of overclocking headroom, and I had no trouble squeezing another 20% or so performance out of the Founders Edition card. The core was stable at a little over 2GHz, and the GDDR5X memory had no issue reaching almost 12 gigabits per second. For a detailed analysis of the overclocking performance, be sure to check out my GTX 1080 overclocking video here. Making the 1080's frame rate performance all the more impressive is the power consumption. Having tested a number of games, we found on average the 1080 system consumed just 266 watts, just a few percent more than the GTX 980 and a little over 20% less than the GTX 980 Ti. Amazing stuff here and I have to admit, the 1080 has well exceeded my efficiency expectations. So let's address the ultimate question, should you race out and buy the GeForce GTX 1080? In a word, no. As nice as the Founders Edition card looks, unless you absolutely require a graphics card that vents hot air externally, I strongly suggest waiting for Nvidia's board partners to release their versions of the card. Chances are they'll run cooler, provide even greater overclocking headroom, and will of course cost considerably less. Although I don't believe AMD's Polaris will change anything here, it might also be wise to wait for them to land later next month before investing any money in a new GPU. 
But really, who's that patient? Like I mentioned earlier, check out my GTX 1080 overclocking video here, subscribe for more Pascal and Polaris content, and if you have any questions, simply ask in the comments. I'm your host Matt as always, and I'll see you guys next time.